Welcome to the Gear Drop Podcast. GearDrop.com, giving you the jump in motocross. Hello and welcome to another GearDrop.com podcast. This week it's the month of the MXGP review, as well as some Supercross talk on that uh, clash between Jason Anderson and a revengeful Malcolm Stewart, but we'll get to that later. First of all, Andy, month of MXGP, the Tim Geyser show really, even in the, in the second, in the first moto, he always liked to have control. He couldn't quite get his way past Prado and Prado was very impressive in the last two laps to, to get just enough of a gap. But the second moto, as soon as Tim Geyser got the whole shot, there wasn't really any doubt that he's the fastest guy right now, probably. And he seems to have control that he can go to another level when he needs to. Very impressive from Tim Geyser all weekend. Absolutely. I mean, it's a Tim Geyser MXGP show. If we're looking at the first two rounds, the quite funny thing is, even though he's been the fastest rider, he's actually only won two motos from four. But uh, that second moto from Prado absolutely killed him. Uh, in terms of the championship, so already 12 points down, uh, and you can't be throwing in random, a random fifth, and, uh, or sorry, a random seventh, even if he hadn't crashed. We don't know if he would have got fourth, and fifth still isn't great either. I mean, I don't know on Geyser's bad day if he's going to have too many sevenths, so not not the second moto Jorge Prado would have wanted for sure, but um, Maxi Mano, very, very impressive with him, really good speed, really good riding, and he should only continue to get better as this season continues, because Let's not forget it. The off season was short, so he really got two months in the 450. And speed wise, he's already there for 20 minutes. So, uh, very encouraging signs for Maxime Renault to get his first MXGP podium. Yeah, with with Prado, he, ne- he de- de- didn't deliver the start when he needed to in the first moto. I thought it was going to be like a British Grand Prix again. The two point span motos, Prado was able to get the start. But the second moto, it's not the best track to not get a good start. Even Tim Geyser mentioned that, but he. Got those starts and that Honda's looking fantastic out of the gate. Jorge Prado didn't get it. For me, he actually came up not too bad, except for the fact he couldn't get around Olsen. If he had have got Olsen, I think, earlier, not that he got him at all, but if he had have been able to get him earlier, I think he maybe would have got around Bogers as well and ended up with a third, which would have been pretty good damage limitation. But the longer he spent behind Olsen, who for me maybe at his best weekend of his MXGP career, Definitely show riding with more intensity and maybe the, the level of this year's MX2 graduates has maybe given give him a bit of a wake-up call and maybe helped him realise that he should be that good and he shouldn't be feeling his way into MXGP. He should be coming in and challenging for those top five positions. Unfortunately for Jorge Prado, Olsen's ride came at a bad time for him. He couldn't get the pass. He was looking like he was going to go for it those last couple of laps. Made a mistake, said there was dirt in his goggles and he couldn't focus properly with his eyes were watering that's why he hit that bump and went down and with MXGP that top 10 being so competitive even late in the race he went down and he still he actually lost two positions sometimes you can go down at that point in the race and you don't lose any positions but for Jorge Prado it was a points problem 12 points isn't too bad at the minute but you can't keep losing five six points each round or it's going to develop into a problem because Tim Geyser Without Jeffrey Hurlings, looks like he has mental control on the rest of the field, at least in his mind. And Prado, we know, can do it when he gets the starts. But we've just seen in Mantova, when he doesn't get the start, it can be a bit of a problem. Absolutely. Just on Prado, I mean, he rode okay until he called it to Olsen. But to be honest, I think Olsen was holding his own quite comfortably there. I mean, obviously, Prado was a little bit quicker, but it's not like he was putting him under a complete complete pressure you know he wasn't really he was it was usually about a second or so splitting him it's not like he was showing him the wheel every corner I think if Prado had it done that and applied a bit more pressure he probably would have got through okay because if, if you reverse the rules I think if Geyser had been in Prado's situation I personally believe Geyser would have come up to at least third with no issues at all so I don't think Prado had his best motto to say the least obviously it sounded nice and eyes and that was hindering him but Certainly not what he would have wanted, and, and seventh isn't isn't great after you know winning two motos in a row. The confidence would have been high, so that seventh is a bit of a downer. And but he, and he needs to go into Argentina, um, a hundred percent committed now to try and get try and get an, at least another moto win. Uh, on Olsen, very very good. I think uh, a ride like this has been brewing for quite a while, but just just wasn't clicking. But it's nice to see all weekend at Montevideo he, he, he had the pace to run at the front and. Hopefully that can be the start of something now where he's consistently running in the top five. Obviously he went 6-4 for, for sixth overall. 
which I would, uh, and in terms of his riding, I think was his best MXGP um, race so far of his career. So that should be a big confidence booster. And I think Olsen is a rider that needs something like that to kickstart him sometimes. So fingers crossed he can build on from this and keep improving now. Yeah, for me, he definitely made a big jump this weekend. And I don't know if you think it's maybe the, the level Renew, Ruben Fernandes and, and even Jed Beaton have come in. They haven't really had that kind of respect or too much respect or awe for this class. They've just came in and got on with it and brought their form from MX2 straight into the 450s. Olsen probably didn't do that last year. He kind of got his feet wet. This year, it looks like, maybe even from that second moto in Matterley, he was at the back end of the top 10, but he was riding well. This week, he actually got better starts, and it was definitely, for me at least, more intensity in his riding. Yeah, definitely a lot more intensity. Although, what I would say is, without Hurlings and Fever there at the moment, it's obviously, the, the speed at the front isn't obviously as fast as last year. And yeah. I think, so for somebody like Olsen, that's... That's a plus, I think, for somebody like him, because then he feels like he can be maybe be one of the men, you know, maybe maybe not a podium guy, but a fourth to eighth guy. And if he keeps doing that regularly, then he should keep improving. But I don't think Olsen's this type of rider to look at other riders. I think he just focuses on himself. But like I say, I think not having that mad speed that was there last year is maybe helping so, somebody like Olsen and, he, and even somebody like Brian Bodgers, who deserves a lot of credit. After two rounds, he's fifth in the MXGP World Championship standing. So... What a start to the season he's had as well in the standing construct, Husqvarna. Yeah, and he rode really well. It's both motos, actually, the first moto, he lost a couple of places right at the end, I think. He got on pump, yeah. yeah. Didn't really reflect how well he'd rode. If you just looked at the results and hadn't watched the race, he was up there all moto. Second moto, he was able to deliver the result that, uh, that his riding indicated he had in the first moto. And nice to see that as well. It's nice to see those guys that were maybe 8 to 12 last year probably going to an extra level. Olsen falls into that category as well. And for me, that was the Olsen I was actually expecting last year. It's maybe coming a year late, but it's nice to see him. Yes, you put Hurlings and Feber in there and he maybe goes down a couple of places, but his actual riding, I think, has come on. He's definitely riding with more intensity. Stefan Evers mentioned he needed to believe in himself more. And at Mantova, I felt you could see that in his riding. There was no almost second guessing or waiting to see how it would go. He was just going for it. And that was, that was really good to see. But Maxime Renault, he's very, very close. He's probably the third guy that can run that pace along with Prado and Geyser. But as you mentioned, just at the end of the races, he doesn't, I don't know whether it's strength. It could be just a mental factor of just getting used to that intensity that the, the level Geyser and Prado were going at for 30, 35 minutes whenever you get away at the front. <clears throat> he had to try and reel them in a little bit as well. And maybe he's just still getting all that sorted out. But as you mentioned, speed-wise, he seems to be there. He'll know when Jorge Prado will know now that with Tim Geyser starts, you can't afford to let him get too far in front of you out of the first turn. Does that So that's going to be something going forward. Those two are going to have to be conscious of because if, if you get you let Geyser get away, it looks like he can run away. But for Maxime Renault, first two rounds, you have to be very pleased. He got that heat race win at Matterley on the podium at Mantova. The speed's certainly there. And maybe with two weeks before Argentina, he'll get that extra strength and a bit more experience. He's certainly got the knowledge and two GPs of the two dev format. He's got to have learned an awful lot already in his first year of the, of the class. And I think you're just going to see consistent improvement from Maxime Renault. Certainly a GP win. Maybe soon in one of these first six rounds wouldn't be out of the question if he can get the starts. Agreed. It's certainly not out of the question. I mean, we're two rounds in. He's third in the championship. I think you could say Geyser's the only rider that's like a lot quicker than him. I don't think he's too far off Prado. In some races, he's probably been as fast as Prado. So, I mean, looking at that, a very, very encouraging start this season. And also, he's top dog at Yamaha so far. Um, so that's also a positive point. Like you say, the first 20 minutes he's there, he's got the speed. Part of me thinks he's just playing a smart game. And once, you know, Geyser and Prado in, in, the, in the first moto stepped it up i think maybe part of him knew that he wasn't going to be able to go with them and just you know um sell for third not do anything stupid and just bring home a top result and at the end of the day obviously he might need a little bit more intensity as the season continues in that last five minutes but i think for now i'll be very happy with where he's at you know he had the intensity for 20 minutes and then i think he just cruised home to be honest to bring the result home and he's already got an mxgp podium He's already exceeding expectations, I would say. So 
and he should only he should continue to get better as he adapts to the bike. One thing that is worth pointing out, it was a short off season. He really only started in January to ride the 450 and the first round was in February. So uh, on a normal season where the, or the last season wouldn't have ended, went on as long, you know, he would have a lot more time to prepare. So I think it's, he couldn't have asked for much more, I don't think, from the first two rounds. Yeah, I think he has to be pretty happy. Third in the championship, he, ha- he knows he has the speed now. And it's probably just little details here and there that he's learning. Jeremy Sewer, kind of in contrast to Maxime Renault, who, as you alluded to, maybe played it a wee bit smart if he was getting tired. He didn't want to push the envelope because we saw that track both Saturday and Sunday. Pretty sketchy in places, hard pack underneath the sand. Sometimes you had a big berm, sometimes you just hard pack. And that section where Roman Fevre looped out at the end of the championship last year. The bumps coming out over there were wild. The guys were actually squaring that corner off slightly and ending up going to the right of those bumps to, to miss them as much as, the, as they could, especially that second race. So very easy to make mistakes. And unfortunately, fortunately for Jeremy Sear, he made a couple. Again, when he was in position at the front of the pack, a wee bit like Matterly Basin in race one, Sear's riding really well, but those wee mistakes are hurting him at the minute. And it's just a question of, again, can he overcome that and start to get these race wins whenever he's in position, whenever he's there with Tim Geyser, when he's there with Jorge Prado and, probably when he's going to have to be there with Maxime Renault to be able to come out on top of those battles and not make those mistakes. Absolutely. Sewer's another rider that does have the speed to be there, but like you alluded to, it's just the mistakes that are costing him at the moment. You know, he crashed out in the lead in uh, Matterly and Montevideo. If he keeps it in two wheels, you never know. He might bring the win, the wins home in those two motos, and that would be a game changer as far as he's concerned. But one thing I would say is, whenever you see Prado, Geyser and Renault riding, um, they all look really, really smooth. And Sewer, Sewer is quite strange to me because on the 250, I always thought he was really smooth. And he, he used to ride with the yeah, precise, and yeah, ride, like yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And he, and I always thought in the 250 he needed to be more aggressive. But he's near had an opposite effect on the 450 where he's went ultra aggressive now. And you can see maybe he's riding on the edge to be at the front. Think so, yeah. you, you know, it's not easy to do to get an, a win in this class. So maybe sometimes you do have to ride on the edge. But um, it, it is interesting to me that he's now one of the more aggressive riders. But whenever he was an MX2, he was one of the more smoother guys that needed to be more, more aggressive. So it's definitely something he worked on. But on the 450, he could maybe go back to trying to be this smooth again. And like you alluded to, the, the track was really good this year, I think. Very unique for Mantova. Obviously, the dry, the dry weather meant it wasn't as sandy as usual and even though I, I do think it's good to have sand races I didn't mind the track being the way it was this year because the have ro- road Mantua for so, so much the last couple of years so it was challenging and plenty of score edge bumps out there and definitely could catch out so it was a good technical and rough track. Yeah and with Sewer as you mentioned the intensity of that class it, it's almost like Jeremy came to the conclusion that being consistent and smooth just wasn't going to be good enough if he wanted to achieve his goals and become a race winner and challenge for a world title, yes, he could maybe be smooth and get, get top fives consistently, four to seven or whatever. But if you want to be in that top three and really go for those wins, you have to ride with extra intensity. Jorge Prado can do that and still be ultra smooth, but he's a very special talent on the technical level of Stefan Everts. Not any, most people can't actually ride like that, that smooth at that pace. He's the, the rare one that can a generation or two since that was last seen, probably with, with Stefan and maybe Jean-Michel Bale before that. That doesn't really happen. Even Jeffrey Hurlings can look aggressive, can look ragged. And we've seen Tim Geyser certainly have some moments, although at times he does look smooth, but it, it's not it's not that smooth precision that, that Jorge can do and still win races. So Jeremy seems to have recognised that fact that he might have to take more risks, that he might have to ride the edge. And also figure out how to be able to do that without throwing it away. And he, he's all he's right on the precipice, I feel, of finding that perfect balance. But he also has to prove he can win. Not just to everyone else, he has to prove he can win to himself and not just once in a blue moon to do it consistently to be a world champion. And I feel like in his head, he still has to do that. So he's maybe not as calm either as a Jorge Prado. He's very confident, knows if he gets a start, he never panics. Doesn't matter how much pressure he has. Coming from behind, he can deliver generally. Sewer still has to do that. The other guys he's battling have kind of done that over and over again. And maybe once Sewer gets a couple of those wins, that'll maybe be the breakthrough and maybe calm him down from those little mistakes because 
when you see him generally, he's really fast and he's really probably closer than he's ever been to being a consistent race winning threat. He just has to get over the line a couple of times to maybe just calm that down and be there consistently. It is a good point you make, actually, because Sewer is one of the most experienced riders in the class now, I would say. And, you know, he's pretty much done everything apart from win and win a championship. You know, he's got podiums. Mm-hmm. I think last year he finished fourth. Bad year, obviously, with Epstein Bar virus, but he made it a good one in the end. And then I think with two years before that, he finished second. So sort of the next thing for him is to try and win a title. So it probably does explain why he is riding on the edge and why he's trying so hard because, you know, he's, he's, he's finished th- second, third, fourth, and fifth plenty of times now. And a p- part of him is maybe a little bit sick of finishing there and he yeah. just wants to stand the top step more. So, yeah, it's a good point. And that's probably why he is pushing extra hard this year. Because And also with uh, Herlings and Fever out, you know, the door's open. So it probably explains it. And you touched on Geyser's style there. I don't know what you think about it is, but I definitely feel whenever Herlings isn't there, he's a lot more smooth. He's a lot more in control. Yeah, he's exactly. almost like a different rider there, to be honest. I think mentally, he thinks he's got the other ones beat. But maybe when, when Herlings isn't there, he doesn't think that. So that's maybe yeah. why I would see his different style, possibly. Yeah, it's almost like he has this level of control he feels he has over everyone else. Maybe Jorge Prado... Not as much. He knows that, you know, if Jorge gets the whole shot, it's on. But I still think he feels out of 20 rounds, 40 races, he'll maybe come out on top more than most of the bad races. If Brado gets a bad start like he did in Mantova, maybe Tim feels he can come through better. Whereas when Jeffrey gets there, I feel Jeffrey might be the one guy that Tim doesn't feel he has covered on on raw pace. Or maybe in the case of Prado, they're they're similar. I think everyone else, he feels if he's on his 100% game, he's quicker or as quick as. With Jeffrey, I still think he wants to prove he can do it. He's yet to beat Jeffrey when Jeffrey doesn't get injured in a championship. It isn't necessarily Tim's fault, of course. He came very close last year, couldn't quite do it, but there were races he flat out beat Jeffrey Hurling straight up, and Jeffrey admitted Tim was faster on those certain days. But when it really came down to it, Jeffrey was still able to produce speed that no one else could produce. And that seems to be the one thing that maybe gets in Tim's head or maybe. It's not so much in his head, but he just wants to beat him so bad that sometimes things go awry. Whereas whenever Jeffrey's out, even against Caroli a couple of years ago, Tim just seems to grow in confidence and be extra calm on the track. And when Jeffrey comes back, something seems to change there. So for me, it'll be interesting when Jeffrey does get back, depending on the championship position, will Tim be able to let Jeffrey go race after race? Or will he want to try and beat him the way Maxime Renew wanted to prove he was was faster, faster than Tom Vial last year? even though Tom was out of the championship. Definitely going to be interesting. Uh, from Geyser's perspective, this probably isn't the year to go balls out and try no. to beat Herring Sons <laughs> return because it's there's a championship not. at stake. So maybe we'll have to wait for next year when hopefully both of them will start the season fully healthy and it'll, they'll be reset at, at zero points again. But yeah, it'll definitely be, it'll add an extra element there anyway, that's for sure. And, but yeah, I, it's all, I've always thought that, you know, Geyser is, He's almost a different rider when Hurlings isn't there, in my opinion. And I, I sort of wish he would ride like that when Hurlings was there. But maybe it's a mental thing where he feels like he can't, or it could be. But anyway, guys are started this season, season phenomenally well. And he's definitely going to take some stopping to win this title this year, I think. I think last year was the closest he's been to mm. being calm against Jeffrey, but that crash and lockout opened the door for Jeffrey again. And then the, the collarbone injury for, for Tim unravel that kind of any type of serenity he did have because he was coming back from injury and they were both ended up riding injured and it was Jeffrey that it was we all know ultimately produced when he really really had to and had that speed when he really had to to produce it that no one else seemed to be able to quite get close but but the, that's Jeffrey Hurlings for you Tim though this year and even last year he does have that extra bit of speed it's just Jeffrey Hurling seems to be able to consistently raise the bar so what could be interesting this year from Jeffrey Hurling's perspective, if Jorge Prado continues to lose a couple of points here and there like he has in these four rounds, Jeffrey Hurling comes back, isn't directly in the championship. At some point, does Jeffrey have to do what Tony Crowley and Jorge Prado did last year and get in between Jorge Prado and Tim Geyser? Will there be a let Jorge by pit board coming out at the end of this season to get those extra three points, two, three points? That could be something interesting to watch. Jeez, we're only at at round two here, Johnny. 
Oh no, but <laughs> we'll, I mean, we'll save that talk for later on the season to see what happens. But I yeah, think it, I think it'd be uh, quite ironic given what happened last year that Jeffrey is now in the position that his teammates were in last year. Yeah, that is very true. That is very true. But there's a there's still a lot of racing left before Jeffrey comes back, probably. So God knows what the championship will look like and who's still injury free whenever he comes back. But it's certainly something to keep an eye on. Yeah. Is there any chance he could be back for Argentina? Do you think, or have you heard? Nah. No, nah, I don't think so. There, I mean, there, there is even talk he might not be back at MXGP, so there, there is one for you, but we'll have well, to yeah, see how it all goes. There's talk he might want to do the MN Nationals. And yeah. When I asked Joel Smets, you can see that interview on YouTube, he said no, but then he also added the caveat, not at this moment. So the longer this goes, the Jeff isn't on the bike for a potential world championship, maybe the wheels are going to put in motion that this is the year because of injury that he could go for an MA National Championship. And with the GP's going on longer, maybe he could still get the GP win record and go for an MA national title as well, which would, as bad as the start of this season has been, it would actually end up a pretty pretty remarkable year for him. From Jeffrey's point of view, yes, but from KTN's point of view, they have no being an MXGP at the moment, so I can't see them allowing him to do AMA, but maybe they'll come to some sort of agreement, but uh, I mean, if you're KTM in Europe, you're saying no. I mean, they desperately need an MXGP rider, and got nobody there at the minute and they know themselves when Harding's is fully fit he can he can win races so if you're KTM in Europe it doesn't make sense but you know you have to keep a rider happy as well so this would if they're going to allow him to do an AMA championship season this would probably be the year that they let him so it will be it'll be something to keep an eye on anyway and outdoors KTM in America haven't pulled up any trees recently either so as you said for if there's going to be a year Jeffrey could do it it might be this year and if he can get back early enough, he should be relatively fit to, to go for that first round. And it might help KTM in America because Cooper Webb hasn't really been amazing outdoors the two years he's won the Supercross title. No, I think you're right. Although what I would say is I, I think MXGP would pull rank on, on AMA Nationals from KTM's point of view. But then I suppose it would add a lot of exposure too. Yeah. Maybe what I could see happening is maybe, and maybe even for Jeffrey it wouldn't be so bad either, is just race MXGP and then race selected AMA rounds. That might be that might be the compromise, maybe. Because I mean, if he does AMA, he's got a lot to lose if he does the whole championship. Because if he does it all and doesn't win, you know what the Americans are going to say. Whereas if he does selected rounds, you know nobody will never really know if he wins the title. And if he does win two or three rounds that he does, it'll it'll look better than if he does them all and doesn't win. So it'll be interesting at this stage. It's only just a rumor, but certainly something to keep an eye on what if he does what Tortelli did in 99 and just decimates the field goes 1-1 one, one, round 1 can you see him then going back to a Grand Prix the week after is he going to be like look yeah. Pitt Barra I'm uh, got the red plate here it's 11 rounds it's 11 days it's a one day format can I just do this as, the only, as you said this could be my, the, my only chance well then, KTM we need the ring KTM would need to ring Crowley up then and get him back up racing MXGP. <laughs> yeah, KTM could look back on this as this horrible winter and maybe regret the fact yeah. that Tony Crowley retired last year and that they maybe could have let him yeah. do this full GP season because aside from Tim Geyser, who's going really well and obviously Jorge Prado, there's nobody really out there that you wouldn't think Crowley wouldn't be beaten at least. And there's nothing to say that if the form he was in last year when he was fully healthy, he couldn't be running at the front with Geyser Prado and Rio as well, anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but although the only thing is, I don't know if Crowley would have raced with, um, not on at the Cardi bike. So that's another element that. Um, but then I suppose maybe so Prado have, could have yeah. went to create. Yeah, it's, it's, awkward it's an awkward yeah, yeah, fair, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, goes Lucien Crowley at the British Grand Prix stand and um, stand beside him in the pit lane or the pit area for one of the practice sessions and it was absolutely freezing and I was thinking he'd probably prefer to be out there actually keeping warm and just <laughs> standing about watching uh, watching the other the other riders. I'm sure he wouldn't mind normally, but that wasn't really the best weather to be watching the race. He'd, at least he'd get warmed up riding. Yeah, exactly. It was a shame not to see him at Maddie, but oh well, it is what it is. Um, hopefully we'll see him do selected GPs this year and then obviously Crowley is talk he'll do a few MA rounds as well so something to keep an eye on and obviously with Jeffrey too but hopefully Jeffrey will be back on a bike I would say maybe three or four weeks time we could see Jeffrey on a bike how long it'll take him to get up to speed remains to be seen but hopefully we'll see him back at the races soon 
And for Crowley, there's a potential of maybe even doing this World Supercross series. You never know. He, he's kind of free to do what he wants, it seems. Yeah, true. I never actually thought about that. That is a good point. We still have no idea what riders that's going to attract, but Crowley, as good as he is, could probably do it and win the flipping thing. He's that talented. But, well, with yeah. Solomon Paris, yes, it <laughs> exactly. wasn't like a full-scale AMA yeah. track on no whips, but the, the basics are there for Crowley. He ran Justin Brayton's speed. Um, Brayton's still top 10 in America. Roman Fevre wasn't far off um, Marvin Musquin. Crowley was running the fastest laps of the night at the end of that third main in Paris. Yes, he might be a wee bit old to learn how to go through whips like uh, Chad Reid or someone, but aside from that, I think obviously the, the talent and skills there, he, he's just never done Supercross in 20-odd years. That's why it might be a bit difficult, but the, the ability's there to learn it. And if he knows he's doing Supercross, if this is maybe in the pipeline, I'm sure he could pick it up to an extent to be competitive in this type of series. But again, that's that's a bit of, of speculation just based on the fact that Crowley seems to be able to do what he what he wants this year. Yeah, although another thing that's worth pointing out is we don't know what these World SX tracks are going to be like either. You know, if there's well, that's true, yeah. quite a lot of European riders doing it, they might, you know, they might not have massive big whips, the, you know, so it's a leveler. So. The price from fund is huge as well, so that yeah. could get the likes of Crowley. Yeah. Not that that man needs the money, but I mean, it's it's still a good thing to be doing if you're coming to the end of your career. You're, there's a lot of prize money in offer, and you've maybe always harbored the idea of doing Supercross. I know he always watched America and, and like Jeremy McGrath and maybe this is maybe the opportunity to do a bit of Supercross without that kind of, you can't get injured for the Grand Prix that what's happened, unfortunately happened per Roman Fevre. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Definitely one to keep an eye on anyway. Anyway, I've got completely yeah. distracted here. I was so, thinking that, yep. <laughs> back to Side Mantova. Crap. We've seen that that top six there, Thomas Kyrgios in sixth overall, but Ruben Fernandez seventh overall. The way he had that crash out the front door over that finish line jump, I was happy to see he was okay. He's had a couple of prangs already, one at the British Grand Prix, one in Mantova. But again, he showed when he stays on the bike, he's fast. And he's actually pretty consistent once he got going there in Mantova. Seventh overall, strong ride for him. And also to, to add to that, Jeremy Van Horbeek, or Van Horbeek, again, very, very impressive on the better. Fast, consistent. He looks like he's got good fitness, the bike. Wasn't seemed to have trouble last year in the sand, not so much this year. I know it was more of maybe more of a hard pack base, but even the Sunday was sand there. And Horbeck very fast again. And maybe one of the most surprising and unexpected and under the radar performances was Jordy Tex here, ninth overall. They didn't show too much of him, but he was there. He was in the mix, putting a couple of hard passes on and a really, really good ride for Jordy Tex here. Yeah, firstly, just on Fernandez, I'm going to give him a round of applause because. It's, you know, one thing, he's very, very eager to run at the front. I think everybody can see that. But, you know, on Sunday, he was consistent. He went five, six in the motos. And quite unluckily, actually, to get seventh overall on another day, you know, you could be top five with a five, with a fifth and a sixth. And I think that's just what he needs to do until he gets used to his surroundings in this MXGP class. He probably has got the pace to deliver better results and run more at the front. But... You know, we've already seen him through the wars this year and we're only two rounds in. So I think it's it's important for him just to get a few consistent a few consistent rounds under his belt before he uh, unleashes more of his speed, let's say. But uh, I was I was glad to see him have a good day on Sunday. Nothing outrageous in terms of speed, but very, very solid. And a seventh overall is very, very good. Van Horbeek, not bad at all for, you know, if there was a rider in this paddock that might be struggling for motivation, you would think maybe it would be Van Horvick because this could be his last year race in MXGP. He's not really riding, you know, to sh- secure another factor ride or anything like that. But, you know, he, he looks just to be enjoying it again. And maybe he's just went back to the basics and enjoying racing. And it certainly seemed to be working. Eighth overall in the championship after two rounds and showed a lot of speed in two different type of tracks. Jordy Texer had a disaster at Mallory Basin, but it was nice to see him turn it around at Mantova. And that ninth in the second moto, I think he had the fourth or the fifth quickest lap time, unbelievably. I actually seen that and thought, hmm, yeah. the factory KTM need a rider and they're desperate. Wouldn't be a bad shot, actually. He's yeah, been and, yeah, and he'd be able to work with the likes of Smets again. That, you know, he, and when he was there before, he was very, very good. He won an MX2 World title. So if KTM were desperately looking around and Hernings isn't going to race, Tex here might, might be an option for them. You sure, should he would be some that. sort of talent scout advisor for these factory teams or something. Get a wee, get a wee bonus. Why not? Joel Smets, give us a wee tax, mate. 
I'll sort you out. Although I would just tell Hurlings he's not riding an MMA. So well, maybe you might better not s- like us. Carefree, go if you want. Next thing is exciting. Book us a flight <laughs> so we can see it. Um, ben Watson, 10th overall. A wee bit like Matterly Basins. The Saturday wasn't amazing, but when the races got going, Ben got going. Tenth overall, not too bad under the circumstances. I'm sure he's still feeling <clears throat> a bit second hand. He now has two weeks off to recuperate. And I think all in all, given given the crash, it hasn't been too bad. Although when you're the only factory rider, fact for factory Kawasaki, there is pressure on you, and you probably want to be further into that top top ten. Ben probably will see what Thomas Kier Olsen did in Mantova and think that's really where I kind of need to be too up in that mix. But for now, he's probably made the best of a bad situation after that crash at the British Grand Prix. But I think starts for one thing, he's going to need to improve. And that maybe comes from having a better Saturday, to get a better gate pick to start to see the front of the pack a bit more. But so, so start, not too bad for Ben Watson under the circumstances. Top 10 is okay. I mean, after free practice and time practice, you are scratching your head and the alarm bells are ringing. But what I will say is he does, he has been put at a pulling it around on the Sundays for sure. I, I feel like, like you said, the starts aren't great and maybe the first 10 minutes of the motos aren't that great, but he's actually ending the motos good and he's making a lot of passes. So there's definitely progress there. If he can get back up to 100% fitness as soon as possible, improve his qualifying and get a start and just hang in there the first 10 minutes. He has got speed, late race speed. So yeah, I think he's turned the race days around well, considering how the Saturdays went at both rounds. So I think he, 12th in the championship isn't too bad and I think the only way should be up now because I don't think he'll ride much worse than that at, during the course of the season. Yeah, he's built himself kind of a platform, I think, to, to bounce off of once he's feeling better. Brent Van Donick, good day for him, I would think, 11th overall, but who guy who really deserves a special mention is Mitch Evans. He had a relatively tough first round, but you can completely understand that after being off the bike so long. He got his laps in, he got his races in, he got his fitness built and probably a bit of confidence that at least I've came through my first round healthy, I've done it and I've got 30 minute motors under my belt on the two day format back. This week in Mantova, much more competitive, even in the times on Saturday, 12th overall, kind of battling more with the riders he would be expecting to battle with, at least when he kind of went to that next level at the end before he got injured in his rookie 450 season. But certainly if you're knocking on the door of a top 10, in your second race back after being off for a year, it's a pretty rapid improvement in a week for, for Mitch Evans. And it's hard not to be pleased for him because he's had a very, very tough 12 months. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I was just going to say there, you said he had a tough first <clears throat> um, at, so early in the season. So 12th overall, step in the right direction. And for Evans now, it's just about getting motos and getting bike time and race time under his belt and he should continue to improve. That's going to be one of the most interesting parts of this year because if he's made that improvement in a week, and we know the talent he had by the end of last year and riding with Tim Geiser, knowing what Ruben Fernandez is doing. He's not going to want to be outside the top 10 for too long once he starts getting his confidence and fitness back. So Evans could be one of these guys that really starts to affect the, the more leading positions as the season goes on, certainly halfway through the season. So he'll, he'll be one to, to definitely keep an eye on because I wasn't expecting him to progress that quickly in a week. No, 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 neither was I. So encouraging signs, really encouraging signs. But... The last thing he needs right now is to get carried away and end up injured again. So just take it day by day, race by race. And I think, like you said, once it hits the halfway mark, hopefully um, he'll have enough races under his belt to, to really show what he can do and get back to the level that he once was in the MXGP ca- or the MX2 category and his, his early days in the MXGP class when he was phenomenal at Matterley Basin on his debut. Colin Durandran, okay. Probably one of the better starts. Alberto Ferrado. Really good pace again in the first race, <clears throat> right in there in the top 10. DNF second race, though, but still, Ferrado, a lot of pace and, and very good start so far this season. Alessandro Lupino had a nightmare, first three Grand Prix on the bed of zero points and zero luck, probably. But that, that last moto showed he was in around that top 10, probably more what he was expecting, and a good showing for better to have two guys on that pace. Henry Jacoby again. More visible Henry Jacoby than he was at the British Grand Prix. He got that good start. He even tried to hold Tim Geyser off. That's kind of what you expect out of Henry Jacoby. So it was good to see him getting back at the, in, at the front of the starts and getting some aggressive riding up there. It's got to be good for his confidence. He's 
generally riding in pain, it seems a lot of the time. So it'd be nice to see him get get his flow going again and ride pain free and fit. Again, Glenn Kolenhoff has to be scratching his head. Probably the biggest maybe mystery of this round. Decent starts and just went backwards. I thought I, I thought the first moto on Matterley was maybe a bit of a blip. He had a good start, rode well for 10 minutes, dropped back to, I think, ninth it was. And then the second moto, he seemed to sort it out. He got third. He thought, well, that's just first race nerves out of the road, a bit of arm pump. But that didn't seem to go away. If anything, it was worse than Mandeville. And Glenn said he couldn't get comfortable on the track all weekend, which is a bit of a worry because... It looks like this Yamaha window of comfort. He hasn't quite found the, the, the main setting yet. Well, if they weren't already ringing, the alarm bells will most certainly be ringing now. That was not not what the doctor ordered for Glenn Kohlenhoff. I would say maybe his worst MXGP round of his career. When's he ever finished 17th overall? And it's not like he doesn't have good fitness. You know, he works yeah, hard. So exactly. It's, uh, it's a comfort it's, issue with the bike at the end of the look it, of it. Yeah, it's quite sad to see actually because... We know he belongs, and at the very worst, he just at least got the top third 10. last week in the yeah, second moto. Yeah, you know, it's, he belongs it's in the top five, especially with this year's lineup. So, very, very baffling. But they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and hopefully sort this out because if this keeps going, he might not even be at Red Bull, which is crazy to think. At, you know, at this stage in the season, but yeah, hopefully he can numbers, figure yeah. it out and keep keep him get get back to even what he was last year, and then try and build from there. Is, is what the direction they probably have to go in, but worrying times I would say after that GP yeah he has a week at least to try and find something but Glenn Kohlenhoff just that discrepancy in results even in four rounds and he's getting pretty good starts and his teammates are riding fast the full moto so to me it definitely looks like a comfort trust issue on with with the Yamaha because he's shown when he's feeling comfortable he can still get a top three in MXGP but that's going to be very very interesting as the season's on his second year of a two-year contract at Yamaha as well Paul's Jonas, yeah. maybe something that kind of sums his MXGP career up. He was supposed to go for an operation after the first round of the British Grand Prix. It got postponed, so then he couldn't do the first round. Then he came back, and he just goes top 10 straight off the bat. And then I think the wound opened or something. Yeah, sure the, sure yeah the first moto, right. So he couldn't ride the second moto. So again, it's so stop-start for Paul's Jonas. I would love to see him get a winter with no injuries, full fitness, good starts, and just see what he can really do because he's another one that I know he was able to race this weekend, but really he hasn't been able to race to his full potential again. And I think he could be up there maybe with Renault, with Sewer, with those guys, if he actually had a better run of good fortune. Yeah, I actually agree. And I'm glad you said that. I was going to say the exact same. I think if he had a full winter's prep with no issues, I definitely think he'd be a podium guy this year. So it is very unfortunate, but hopefully he can get this sorted and hopefully be back in Argentina and then build from there, fingers crossed. It's an interesting situation, that standing construct. Tim hmm. Mathis, he runs a good team. Whatever he does there, those riders seem to always ride to their potential. We've seen Jonas with bad luck, but good speed. He's had difficulties at the start of this year that we just mentioned. Brian Bogers just steps straight into that, that vacuum and fills it. Fourth overall, and he was fast at the first round as well. So he's kind of filled that void. He's now having some career best results. We spoke about Glenn Coltenhoff. Glenn had his best MXGP years with Tim as well. And Jonas had a terrible injury the year before, came back last year and was very, very fast as well. Whatever Tim does with his team or whatever way that team's prepared, whether they're in gas, gas, whether they're in Husqvarna, whatever they're on, that team seems to be able to get the most from its riders. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I think maybe some teams try and do too much, but if you stick to the basics, have a good team environment, listen to the rider when, when it comes to bike setup and things like that, you know, you're halfway there. And, and as Tim Geyser always says, a happy rider is a fast yeah. rider. Um, but what I would say is, um, Glenn Kodenhoff, I don't see him being at Yamaha next year. He's already been at the Standing Construct t- team twice in his career. Cam will see him back there for a third time in his career. But then who who loses out on the ride? Or would there be yeah, three riders right. under that awning? Because Brian Bogers be at the minute keep it would be on. very harsh to rule him out of a ride. And the same goes for Paul's yeah. Jonas. Maybe three is the answer. Yeah. The other issue is there were light rumours that Ken Roxon was maybe vaguely interested in coming back to MXGP for a year. But where would he go? Not going to happen. <laughs> where where would he go, though, even if he wanted it to happen? There's only 
is that they would Yamaha have the space to go in there after Kohlenhoff? You couldn't see him doing in Gas Gas or, or KTM with Hurlings and, and Prado as the main guys there. You know, for, yeah. for Ken Roxon, we'll talk about America shortly, but he's in this last year with Honda and things look a bit of a grey area as to what he's going to do next year as well. Is he going to stay in America? Is he going to retire? Is he going to, I think you mentioned Triumph as well, mm-hmm. some sort yeah. of possibility. Back to GPs, it looks like Ken Roxon's in a strange position for, for once. Yeah, if he did want to come to GPs, First of all, he's probably going to have to take a very big wage cut because I don't think he'll be deemed a number one rider in an MXGP factory team. Uh, and looking at the spots available, probably would be Yamaha. But, you know, they've got Yago Gertz coming through. Would they be interested in Roxon? That's for them to answer, not me to answer. Uh, another option could maybe be Triumph if they're going to run an MXGP team this year. Talk as they are. It's going to be the old KRT team making a return, running that manufacturer. Obviously, that's just rumours. Still probably a lot in the works there. But then Triumph are expected to run an AMA team, and I think mm-hmm. that's probably where, where we'll end up seeing Roxon if he does come back and race next year. I still wouldn't be that surprised if he decided to hang the boots up at the end of the year, but certainly something to, to keep a close watch on anyway. Stark Varg. That would be a coup for them to have. I think the advantage Roxon has, he can still turn a competitive lap time. The ability's still there, so... Maybe if he can get whatever the issue is he's having at the minute sorted, he could still get back there. But he's also very marketable. He's a massive Instagram presence. His talent's still going to be there. So if you're Triumph or a new manufacturer, of course, Ricky Carmichael actually had Roxon with the RCH Mm -hmm. Suzuki. He's involved with Triumph. So that would be a good fit in America or GPs. Maybe he could do one year either side. This is just speculation. But for a new manufacturer, you can see the value and, and and putting Ken Roxon on your bike because if you can get the bike competitive, he's still capable of putting putting in results. But the exposure you're going to get from that that for that brand is going to be unbelievable. Either side, GPs absolutely. or America. Yeah, absolutely. That does make a lot of sense. But looking at looking at it from Ken's point of view, where's the motivation for him? I mean, he's used to winning all the time, and he's riding around there to eighth to eleventh these weeks, and he's not used to that. So I wouldn't be surprised if he just decided he's had enough and retires but you know he might be motivated to come back and prove everyone he can still win that might still be at the back of his mind so either way it'll definitely be one to keep an eye on but i wouldn't be at all surprised if he did call it a day because it, it must hurt you know because in the back of his mind he knows he still has the talent and the speed to win races but it's just not happening and that must be pretty yeah. difficult to deal with at the minute if you're Ken Roxon. because he had it we're jumping ahead but it, it only had qualifying time pace but in the race it he kept dropping back slightly off those that main, main top five. So it's, it's certainly a mystery, but it then adds to that intrigue as to what will he do next year? Are Grand Prix a, a viable option? Will he stay in America? Will he retire? Because his performances are probably still good enough to get a ride if he wants one. But what sort of wages will he accept? Does he really want to race? He's a young family. He's a lot of money made because he's been so successful and he's kind of been the main man in every team throughout his career and are being bought as the next guy to win championships. So the investment's been there for him. And it'll be in, it's very interesting whether what he'll do next next year. For me, I'd, I'd love to see him back in MXGP just to see how it would go. Another big name to the series, it would add more American eyes onto it, although Ken is obviously German, but he's such a big name in America. From the MXGP side, it would probably be the biggest name they could probably get since Ron Villapoto. So on that level, it would be good for them, but... For Ken Roxon, he's probably a lot of things going on in his mind right now about his future career and his and his life. A little bit of a one to keep an eye on. But let's transition to maybe the most exciting class at Mantova. We've got back to Mantova again eventually. <laughs> MX2 class. That was where the well, that was certainly where the excitement was. And Tom Vial was at the center of it. Simon Langenfelder again was a big story. And I'm happy to say this, and I mean this in a good way. Yago Gertz, no drama. <laughs> the only story he had was that for this time against Vial, he was perfect. Two pretty much perfect motos. Even the second moto, he didn't get the start. You thought was Vial just going to run away with it. Vial done a flip over a tabletop and all by himself and a pretty amazing crash. And it was usually that would be something Yago Gertz would somehow get involved in. He wasn't involved in anything. He was only involved in winning. And that was maybe his best ride of his career, just in terms of how I felt his mentality was. He looked like he had the blinkers on. Nothing was going to rattle him mentally. We know how fast he can go. 
but he had everything else as well in Mantova. And we know he's just been on back on the bike after arm surgery. And he was pretty much just the fastest guy there, straight up and dominated. Really, really impressive. Well, for sure, I think the first moto was the easiest MX2 victory he's probably had in his career so far. He was just he dominated that one really, really, really good. Oh, and then the second, Fial, yeah, the guy who yeah. usually makes make mistakes. Exactly, and it's not even proper sand either. So I don't think you can say you know the track was that much in Gertz's favor because Vial's good in sand too. It's only really tracks that like Lommel, I would say that, that yeah. suits Yago more. So don't think you can put it down to the track either because both are good in those kind of conditions. Yago just rode really, really well. And he, he looks up for it this year, and it's it's nice to see him ride like this. But the second moto, if Simon Lagenfelder had a got out of that Oof. start, whew, what speed he was carrying. And he crashed there. in the second moto yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. I think, uh, you said about Gertz being the quickest rider over the course of the weekend, I think he was. But in that second moto, if Lagenfelder had a got away, he would have took some stopping, I think. Talking of Tom Vial, he was involved in the Saturday as well. He made the pass that wiped us sort of both kind mm. of teammates out in one fell swoop. Took the front wheel from Langenfelder. Langenfelder went down and got yeah. ridden over by Rowan van der Moestijk, who ended up hurting his shoulder. That gave them bad gate picks. Slightly ruined their chances, but in terms of Simon Langenfelder's confidence and perception from us media and fans watching him, Sunday almost solidified him as a, well, let's not jump to and say a title threat, but a rider who's at least capable of getting in amongst that title, those title battles and certainly podiums and race wins more than just one round because... He'd adversity to overcome from on the Saturday. He got to start again. He was on the pace again. Had that incident, was holding his back, had a sore back, had a bad start, both races, came through both motos, and that second moto, he went to another level, even beyond probably what he rode in the British Grand Prix. He's very much in this title now. He didn't lose the points he would have expected him to lose. That could have been a very bad day that killed his momentum from round one, but if anything, that's added to his momentum for me. And I think he's only four points back of, of Iago, who went 1-1, as we just said, in the dominant fashion. But Simon Langenfelder, what a ride. I absolutely agree. I think that Sakamoto, that's very good for him mentally because, you know, he was blasting past guys and he was even catching Iago at the end. Now, obviously, from Iago's perspective, he was just controlling what he had. And if he needed to, he would have upped it. And it probably would have been close if they both got out together. But... For Lagenfelder's frame of, frame of mind now, I think that's that's big the way because you know it's one thing winning, but the way he was able to pa- slice through the pack in that second moto, unbelievable, R- really ridiculous corner speed, really, and probably even though he didn't win in terms of raw speed, that might have been the best race of his MX2 uh, GP career as well. He was really really good, and just on Tom Vial, this guy doesn't usually make mistakes. I think he's, he's made more mis- he's made more mistakes in two rounds this year. Yeah. than maybe his whole GP career so far, especially in such a short time period. So, I mean, I felt sorry for him. He was a warrior. He got back on the bike and he finished and he didn't even get a point. Yeah, it was, so it was a, a complete double blow. <laughs> and yeah, so it's. I just hope he's 100% ready to go in Argentina now, but he needs to, I can't believe him saying it, but he kind of needs to cut the mistakes out now. Yeah, he, he didn't really hardly make a mistake in about three years and he's made... <laughs> three mistakes in three races but that that crash i mean what on earth was going through his mind he was upside down looking down at the track with his boots in the air and then he landed perfectly on the down slope unbelievable it was just it was an uh, insane crash might, yeah might, don't think you'll see a bigger crash all season one of the biggest ever possibly it was that bad it was that crazy just all of a sudden too he said that it was that watered it and the front wheel just washed out on him all of a sudden obviously he wasn't expecting it who no, would be and he just got launched. It was funny when, when the, the cut to it and you just saw him running back yeah. the length of an entire jump to get his bike. <laughs> yeah. And he knew something went not. badly wrong. Yeah. But the Heidi yeah. was up in the air and, you know, he was literally head down, boots in the air. He was Marvelous. basically, he was completely the wrong way around. And Ragdoll. to not get injured, as bad as that went, that was a slightly miraculous that he ended up not getting injured. He can live to fight another day. And he can afford to try and go for this championship again because he could have landed wrong there and the championship could have been over. Oh, absolutely. He's a lucky boy. I mean, how he finished that race, I don't know. I'm still in disbelief at that. He actually got on the bike and finished the race after that. 
what a crazy sport. <laughs> and well, Mantova, it does not disappoint when it comes to big crashes, does it? Well, Bob it's, Chef it's, a few years you. ago, <laughs> then Jasikonis and IVR. And Jeremy Sewer almost jumped, well, he did jump off the track right, well, yeah. on Saturday. He survived that as well. But Tom Vial is still fourth in the championship, 26 points, I think, off Iago Gertz. And I think when you have a crash like that and he let probably he'll think he let that moto win go at the British Grand Prix as well. You're probably going to be happy enough to get to Argentina with all these rounds left with, with only those points to make up. But maybe this goes back to the, the fact he didn't get much riding pre-season. These guys are riding at such a high level. Tom Vial always made it look easy. And yes, he's got a speed back, but maybe those small details, that 1%, that half a percent, putting his laps in over the winter, he just hasn't quite got that yet. A couple of the other guys maybe have, and I don't think Tom likes getting beat, to be honest. No one does, but I mean, I think he likes to be the man and win races and dominate. And I don't think he liked Yago Gertz beating him in the first one. I think he was out to prove a point that he was back to the Tom Vial, who no one seemed to be able to beat over the last couple of years when he was on form, certainly the year of title. And it, it just got away from him in that off that jump. So Vial's going to have to go back and try and work on a strategy where he can have that pace and not uh, not have those mistakes. And it might just be as simple as getting more laps and getting 30-minute motors on the bike in, in these two weeks again. Yeah, I think I think sometimes you forget this is a new a new KTM as well. That's and true, yeah. Vial probably hasn't pushed this bike to its limit all that much because he Good only point, had yeah. uh, three weeks on the bike before Hawkstone. Mm-hmm. Even at Hawkstone... You know, he wasn't that as, you know, you could tell he wasn't pushing like GP speed. So it's really only Matterly and um, and Mantova where he's been pushing this bike to its limit and he's maybe not got that dial yet set up wise and he's maybe not comfortable with it yet, pushing at its limit. So I think he just needs to get a few rounds under his belt now and get comfortable with pushing the bike to its limit and get the, that setup that he had last year where he was immaculate uh, and the year before whenever he hardly made any mistakes. So he needs to try and get back there. But the problem is now he needs to, he can't afford to let Diago Gertz get ahead in the championship. So MX2 is really exciting, actually. Can't wait for the next round in Argentina. Yeah, it looks like things are getting pretty intense pretty quickly in that class. We heard actually at Hawkstone, De Wolf was trying to play mind games with about tear-offs with uh, Fial there at a pre-season race. Fial's move on Simon Langenfelder. I don't think it was intentionally to take anyone out but it was aggressive. Langenfelder probably won't for, forget that either, although they're teammates. Jago Gertz and Vial have a long-standing, albeit pretty respectful, rivalry. But Jago looks like he really wants this title this year. Tom Vial really wants it back. And Kaido Wolf and Simon Langenfelder, the, the two youngsters who are on the pace now to challenge for that as well. And then we have this guy, the surprise, the supreme surprise of Mantova, Andre Adamo. <laughs> Almost wow. somehow missed out on a podium, but luckily for him, he still got it because that would have been incredibly harsh to not get a podium. He rode unbelievable. He led his home Grand Prix. He got on the podium at his home Grand Prix. He rode good last weekend, so this isn't just completely out of the blue. He's went up a level, but this was a new level again in Mantova. You have to be super pleased for him. And you actually texted me today. We were talking and you said Adamo was only 18, actually, and I thought he was around 20. So to be 18 year old, not on a factory machine, albeit a, a strong, strong ride and strong team he is on, but it's not factory KTM Red Bull or anything. This is mightily impressive and just the ability to, to hold the pace. I mean, he, he led Yago pretty for a few laps in that second moto as well. Managed to get the podium after that, the Wolf Langenfelder clash, but really pleased for him and super, super impressive. I have to say, for me, he's the biggest surprise of the season. I mean, he was good last year in his rookie season. He was usually between 10 and 15, but he didn't really have that intensity, you know, and have that breathtaking speed. You need to run the top five, but whatever he's done during the short off season, it's worked wonders. He now has that blistering speed. You need to run at the front, and it sort of came from nowhere, really. Um, I mean, unbelievable. What a day. Best day of his life, he described it as. Yes. That second moto... I mean, he didn't look out of place either. And he's not scared to get stuck in if he has to. Almost missed the podium, but thankfully for him, he ended up second overall. And yes, in my excitement of Andrea Damo, I was researching today, only 18. I was the same as you. I thought he was late 19, maybe turned 20 soon, but only 18 
factory KTM have Tom Vial going to MXGP next year, so they'll be on the lookout for at least one rider. If I'm factory KTM, I'm keeping very close tabs on, on Andre Adamo right now because he has a lot of potential right there. And I think if he hadn't made the podium, I think I would have just brought him up anyway. He was he was not deserving of it, and I'm not sure he don't even know if he's ever managed to get to sleep yet since then. I'm sure he's on the, <laughs> the high of all legal highs. Um, just phenomenal ride, and you know, the first mode he was really good as well, but the second mode to, to lead, and he never really made mistakes, either when he was leading, it was just Yago was riding really, really well, mm-hmm. and then you have sort of generational talent, sorry Steve Mathis, like Kai Wolf. you know, that's fair enough as well, and then Simon Langefelder was maybe riding the race of his life, so the two of them were having the rest of their lives, and then DeWolf, actually, I know DeWolf crashed, but until then he's been really, really smooth, and I was quite happy to see him push that edge a wee bit just I don't think he was completely comfortable on the track but he, he still went for it with Simon it didn't quite work out but he still ended up on the podium um, so a strong start for DeWolf I think he's a wee bit left to go yet in terms of, of raw pace he's a wee bit more to show us but certainly championship wise he's, he's right there and aside from that extra wee bit of effort he put in the last lap but it's the last lap I mean you're gonna have to go for it when you're in his situation Langenfelder is now looking like a championship rival and not just a a one race wonder, so fair enough with that. The Wolves positioning himself well. Gertz is right there, Langenfeller's right there, and in a way, it makes it more exciting to watch that Tom Vial has the, has the time to make up. But if you're going to have the likes of Andre Adamo getting in amongst it, this the MX2 class has proven to be pretty exciting. And while we haven't even got talking about Orgmo and Harrop yet, who were yet again fast and consistent. Absolutely, a really good class this year, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it all unfolds. But and yeah, just like, forgot yeah, about and, he was yeah, really good. yeah, and oh, gifting if he can keep it in two wheels and not go completely mad. It was quite yes. funny watching him and DeWolf <laughs> battle and qualifying whenever he had a really aggressive move on DeWolf, and then DeWolf done it back on him, and he was almost in shock. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very good to watch, really, really good to watch, and um. Just on the Wolf, obviously he came into the season with a lot of hype. And, you know, a podium is still really good for Kaido Wolf, but Lagenfalder came in with very little hype. And I think that's probably the difference so far. I do expect the Wolf as the season uh, carries on that he, he'll he'll be a, a consistent podium guy and he'll probably win races too. So I'm not worried about him at all. And he's still being relatively consistent as well. So better days ahead for Kaido Wolf, even though he had one there in Montevo with the podium. Yeah, and Langenfelder maybe is doing what we maybe expected DeWolf to do at the start of the yeah, season. Which I is think so, strange, but yeah. I think it's probably he benefited from not having that hype and that limelight on him. Probably, whereas yeah. after winning at La Capelle, everyone was like, Kai DeWolf, Kai DeWolf. And we forget they're still young, 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 like 17-year-olds. So, you know, it's a lot of pressure coming into the season. And maybe winning at La Capelle was the worst thing for Kai, but there's no doubt that he'll, he'll win plenty of GPs this year. No doubt about it. Yeah, and he's, he hasn't pushed it when he hasn't had the pace to win, which to me is pretty smart. Yeah. You know, he's if he hasn't got it, he's not settling in a negative way, but settling in a smart way to, to take that top three position that he's in or top four, whatever it may be. Generally, pretty pretty smart first two rounds from Kyle Wolf, and you would imagine at one of these races sooner or later, it's really going to click for him, and he's going to be the guy to beat. But as, as we mentioned, right now, Iago Gertz has the red plate, He's going to have another two weeks in the bike. I don't think he's going to be getting any slower for Argentina. And there's a lot of riders just kind of just building. We've seen Iago win. We've seen Tom Vial have the pace to win. Now he's in a slightly more desperate situation than I have to win. De Wolf will be expecting to win. And Lagenfelder, after these first two rounds, you have to throw in him in there because he's getting the starts. He can come through the field on a track that isn't easy to pass. And he's got the raw pace, whatever way you look at it now. Absolutely. And one thing I would like to point out is these Norwegian talents. What is going on with Norway? I'm really happy for them. They're all nice guys. And it's, it is genuinely nice to see a, such a small country get these uh, talented riders riding at the highest level. But at the same time, it's very, very depressing for us. We've got nobody coming through like this in Ireland. Very depressing. I wish we had even half the town coming through that Norway have. Whatever they're doing, it's definitely working. Um, with Horgmo fifth and Fredriksen sixth overall, that's two Norwegians in the top six. And then they had um, Tondell and Osterhagen in the EMX 250 podium, and they even had a WMX podium. Unbelievable. Yeah, I remember Kenneth Gunderson 
really fast rider, really, <laughs> really talented rider. I think he's kind of working with some of these younger riders yes, now. Yeah. And they've kind of produced four Kenneth Gundersons <laughs> all, at, all at once. But, but Gunderson, you were as fast as he was, you don't think you ever would have expected that there's going to be three or four on that level um, 20, odd, 20 odd years later. So it's, it's really good to see these these countries producing not just one world class rider, but more and more because it just makes the depth better in, in world championship, but it also makes the depth better in the motocross of nations for these smaller countries to have stronger teams and stronger presence. And it's really good for obviously for the future for young riders looking up as well because this generation maybe almost myth, missed Kenneth Gunderson. They would have been quite young when he was in his prime and at, at the front and in, in world championship racing. So for the next generation, it's, it's good to see a reference for them that they're from Norway or Denmark with Thomas Kyrgios and Mikhail Harrop on the heels of, of Brian Jorgensen, that these Scandinavian countries can produce good riders and with Sweden as well. They used to be, Sweden used to be really strong, obviously, mm, years and years yeah. ago, but 70s and, and 80s. And these Scandinavian countries all seem to come into the four at once with Norway probably leading the way at the minute. Really good to see. Yeah, great to see. Um, we have to wait to see how Cole McCulloch develops. Uh, he's our next big hope in Ireland here, so fingers crossed. I think we'll all be seeing him race the AMX 125 Championship this year, but he did miss the first round because he picked up an injury, so looking forward to seeing him in the AMX 125. All our hopes on him, so good luck, Cole. Anyone who's seen Philip McCulloch will probably think it's <laughs> Philip McCulloch riding the bike because I don't think I've ever seen a rider look so like his father riding a motocross bike. It's... it's the exact mirror image so Cole certainly puts the effort in certainly has the determination so yeah Phillip's right behind him and, and they're doing everything they can to see how far they can they can get in this sport so it certainly won't be for a lack of effort with, with Cole McCulloch that's for sure so best wishes to him because he actually wrote pretty good last year in EMX in that 85 mm-hmm. ones yeah. he did but EMX 125 is a, a deep cauldron of talent so certainly that's where you have to be that's where he's going so Definitely the best place for him, but it's he's going to have to learn to swim pretty quickly to, to get on the map. That's it, but at least he has got the Hitachi team behind him. Very, very yeah. good team. They have actually done a really good job with both gifting and casual makers this year in MX2. Gifting, a little bit rash, but when he keeps it in two wheels, you know, he's definitely very, very fast. Rash and fast. Um, eighth overall. And fifth in the second moto was very good. And Cash markers and the qualifying race was running P11, I think, and then he had a really big crash. That's but pretty, for him yeah. to for him to come off come off a one two five and already you know nearly have top ten speed is already is quite impressive. But hopefully the injury isn't too bad and we'll see him back soon because injuries have stopped him developing since his eighty five days, which has been a shame. But Hitachi have definitely done a good job with those two riders. Yeah, as you mentioned, Cole's in a good place, and again. With what Kaismakers is doing, it, it shows you how good that 125 class is. So if you can get a reference for your pace there, work your way up that class, then you're you're showing yourself to be a potential Grand Prix rider for sure. Now, Mario Guadagnini, again, not the best race for him. This time, I think his pace wasn't too bad, but it, it was mistakes, starts. Things are, aren't clicking for him at the minute, which is a bit of a shame because... This time last year, he was he was kind of right in the thick of it at, at the front of the championship, do, doing a Langenfelder almost, and you'd have expected him to be up there again, and he's, he's kind of playing catch-up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not sure what has happened, Guardini, to be honest. last This time last year, the world at his feet, even got a red plate, was getting regular podiums. He, there was a few GPs, you know, stuff happened, and the results weren't great, but it wasn't necessarily the riding. But this year, the riding definitely isn't what it was last year, so... He's going to have to go back to the drawing board, I think. Hopefully, it's just early season pressure and uh, he'll be able to ride like we know he can as the season continues because the way he was riding last year, you know, you could have seen him win GPs this year. So, he has to try and get that level back, hopefully. Felt a bit sorry for Rowan van der Moestijk. First of mm-hmm. all, with that, that crash, nothing he could do on yeah. Saturday. He's actually been riding well, but that was a in the championship, a tough day for him, 10th overall. Actually, a decent first race to come back. Fifth, fifth he got in that first one. Mm-hmm. But race two, top 15 isn't really what he wants. But again, coming from the back, having issues just doesn't make it easy. And it, it opens it up to having more problems. But generally, I think he's actually been riding well. He's probably been very similar to, to the kind of wood speed. But again, these issues just points-wise, going to be difficult to turn that. 
Absolutely. I feel sorry for him. There was nothing he could do with that. And I think even though him and Lagenfelder were riding in pain, I think Van der Moestijk definitely got it worse. She was holding his shoulder and I was I thought uh, he could have broke something there, but thankfully he was able to ride the next day in pain, albeit. But, you know, at least he got points. First moto, like you said, he, the start wasn't quite as bad and he was able to bring home a fifth. I think in the second moto he might have crashed or something and 15th was all he could salvage. But under those circumstances, I think you just need to take it. Hopefully it'll be 100% for Argentina and we can, I think we'll see him on the podium regularly. Um, it's just a shame that happened to him in the qualifying race. Nothing, like we said, nothing he could do about that. No, just wrong place, wrong time, yeah, despite exactly. getting a good start. I mean, kind of right with like Liam Everts the week before. Yeah, yeah. You get the start, you're kind of in what should be a safer scenario. And sometimes with motocross, it all goes wrong. Right, let's talk of all goes wrong. Let's go to AMA Supercross. We'll, we'll get to AMX after. But the story certainly from America is Malcolm Stewart. And for me, it was Malcolm Stewart. What are you thinking? Clearly, he wasn't thinking. <laughs> Revenge was no. on his mind yeah. more than results. And if you're Alden Becker and you're Roger Coster and anyone involved with Husqvarna, you're going to have to sit down and give him a good talking to because that was a bit embarrassing, to be honest. The pass was never on. Yes, Anderson hit Tomac and that careered him into, created Tomac into Malcolm Stewart. But, I mean, keep your composure. You won the heat race. You're in Daytona. You're in Florida where you were born. You've got the fans on your side. You have a chance of a podium. Maybe even a win. I mean, you wouldn't say Cooper Webb is any quicker than him at Daytona. And Cooper very nearly won the race if that okay GM rider Shane McElrath hadn't have cut him off with a couple laps to go. This was Malcolm Stewart's chance for at least a podium minimum. And he just, he lost his head. He lost his composure. He just gave it a handful of throttle into the back wheel of Jason Anderson. Completely stupid, in my opinion. There's no reason he couldn't have kept his composure in that point. Yes, knock Anderson off if you want to for revenge, but at least do it where you're not going to fall yourself and give yourself a good shot at the win or the podium on the night. To do it on that night when you were riding so well, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And a lot of people are saying Anderson had it coming and in some ways he did. But I mean, when Anderson passes somebody, he's usually ahead of them. Even the class with uh, Malcolm the week before, even James Stewart said it was aggressive, but it wasn't mm-hmm. dirty. You know, yeah. Jason was ahead of him at that point. He sort of brake checked him and went in there, but it was slow speed. Malcolm kind of turned down on him, wasn't expecting it and they went down. But this one was just, Malcolm wasn't close enough. He wasn't even side by side. He was barely half a bike, bike length behind it just it wasn't a place to do anything, and that's where he tried to do everything. And he ruined his own race, which is uh, he's also ruined Jason Anderson's championship host. But I don't think Malcolm's going to be too worried about that. And now <laughs> should Husqvarna be? But if you're Husqvarna, you <laughs> you need to, you know, Malcolm was getting annoyed at, at, Mal- at Marvin Muskoin at the first round for not using his brain. Well, he's decided not to use his brain there, and pretty embarrassing. It was almost petulant, and he, he did it before last week or last year on the Yamaha, I think I remember. It might even have been Anderson. It was a Barsha. He went for him and actually ended up crashing himself and ended up off the track in the concrete. So he's starting to get a history of this. If somebody makes contact with him over and over, at some point he's going to lose his mind and potentially wreck his own race. And whenever he's in such a good position in the championship, it's all right if you're 10th. But he's riding so well this year, you can't just sacrifice a result for revenge. Absolutely. Well, the one thing is he's got his revenge now. Hopefully, he can draw a line under it, and that's it yeah. done. Until Anderson has Anderson, the next aggressive I don't move. Think yeah, Anderson's going to be too bothered. But, He'll just yeah, be like, but, right, let's go. <laughs> like yeah, the, the, over now. <laughs> the the thing for me is though, you know, whenever Anderson makes these moves, yes, they're aggressive, but there's a gap there, and he goes for the gap. And the one time when he did clean Malcolm Shirt out, if Malcolm Shirt had a seen it coming, I don't think he, he would have went down. Yeah. But he didn't see it coming. And as a result, he hit he hit Anderson, and that was it. But that move that M- Malcolm Stewart made just pff, I agree with you, Ma- just just tra- just trying to get revenge really, and that was the whole point of that. Bit of a shame because he destroyed his own race and he's destroyed the championship chase now. But it is what it is. Um, but the, the I wouldn't rule out any more fireworks between those two now. <laughs> and I actually thought, well, maybe not if you really like Tomac or, or Malcolm Stewart. Anderson's move on Tomac in the first couple of corners was fantastic. It was just opportunistic. He knew Eli was, was obviously class at Daytona. So what do you have to do? You're six points behind already. You don't want to go nine or further. You put the move on him early and try to get away. He did that. It wasn't dirty. It was aggressive. He bumped him. But at Supercross, nobody went down. Yeah. Malcolm Stewart almost did. But that was a kind of domino effect, not a Jason Anderson, I'm going to take you both out. You know, he 
touch them, but he didn't try to hit, kill them. And then, yeah. but the, the risk is that when you're Jason Anderson and you keep making contact with people, somebody's going to eventually try and get you back. And Eli Tomac never really puts himself in that situation unless maybe your name's Justin Barsha and it becomes too much. But generally, Tomac doesn't really ride like that if he can avoid it. Anderson's riding so well, I think he feels he has to take advantage of his form. And he's already left points out there, not always his fault. Don't forget Justin Barsha cleaned him out at the first round. He's at a cup, he's at a mechanical as well. Mm-hmm. So he's maybe feeling, you know, I'm not points-wise where I should have been if everything had been okay. Maybe a wee bit more desperate to make the moves, but to me, I thought it was a really opportunistic pass and Eli Tomac bumped him a bit, yes, but I mean, it's Supercross and Daytona is not the easiest track to pass on. I thought it was pretty fair, aggressive, but but fair. Uh, Malcolm Stewart just uh, couldn't handle the whole thing. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's super cross and it's very, very hard to pass. And a lot of the time you do have to be aggressive. I personally don't have an issue with that unless you're completely just, you know, you're completely going in all guns out to, to take a guy out. And I don't think Anderson's intentions are to do that. He's very aggressive, yes, but there'll be a gap there and he'll go for the gap. And, you know, the riders around him will know he'll do that. So they should be aware. I don't think he's any worse than Barsha, to be honest. Barsha's the type of guy where if he loses the head, he'll just heave on you. But yeah. Anderson isn't too bad. Like, he's very, very, I agree with James Stewart, actually. Very, very aggressive. But um, it wasn't, a, you know, it's not like he was going in and going, I'm going to kill him. Not yeah. far from it. But Malcolm obviously didn't agree with his brother. <laughs> yeah, maybe his brother angered him even more that he didn't have his back. <laughs> you wouldn't know. But, uh, yeah, if... 18 points now, I think it is, between Anderson and Tomac. And Tomac, I wouldn't say he got lucky beating Webb, but he certainly was given an easier pass, literally pass, through Webb with uh, what happened to Shane McElrath, because it looked like Webb was, was going to fight for that. But Tomac, even when he was in second, he never looked flustered. He wasn't the one that got involved with Jason Anderson on the night. Jim or Malcolm Stewart did that for him. Whatever situation Tomac seems to find himself in, even coming from the back, maybe not the start he wants, whether he's leading with the big lead, his concentration's there, his comfort's there, and he never seems to panic. And this might be the most in control mentally. And I presume that comes from comfort on the bike and then just being happy with the circumstances. This new team, Tomac maybe hasn't ever looked this comfortable before. Absolutely. For me, the biggest things are starts. He's never been the greatest starter, but definitely on this Yamaha, he's definitely getting out of the gate a lot better. And, you know, that's mentally that when you go to the line, if you know there's a chance you're going to get a good start, it definitely makes things a lot easier. Yeah. And then you're not having to try too hard to get a good start, which he's probably done in the past in the Kawasaki. Whatever, whatever way the bike set up, though, is perfect for him at the minute. And I, I think that's been the biggest difference because Tomac has always had the speed to win plenty of supercross races, but a lot of the time he was never able to position himself well, but this year he seems to be able to do that and he's riding really, really well. Yeah. And just on, I don't know if he's riding any better than Anderson, though, but he's, he's certainly managing the races a lot better than Anderson. And Anderson had that's... a bit of uh, unfortunate. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. He's managing the races better than Jason Anderson. Anderson's making contact. He maybe doesn't always need to. He's creating a scenario where he can get himself in trouble. And Eli Tomac doesn't do that. And from there, it's ultimately worked out that it's Eli Tomac has the big points lead now and Cooper Webb couldn't beat him. Jason Anderson had his troubles. It's Eli Tomac's to lose. Absolutely. I think it will take a miracle now for T- Tomac not to win this championship. I feel he's in a really good position and it would t- he needs to have a bit of a disaster, I think, and Anderson would really need to capitalise. But obviously there is quite a lot of racing still left, so anything can happen in this sport you wouldn't know. But... Definitely, um, Tomac is the strong favourite now. 250 class in America. Is it time to have one 250 class? Because I feel a couple of injuries in both classes and the depth kind of gets evaporated. You've one or two riders now that are really going for the championship. But really, I think everyone now wants to see Jet Lawrence versus Christian Craig because those seem to be the two fastest guys. And unless they have problems, the other guys don't seem to have the raw speed to beat them. Cameron McAdoo made the best of a bad start at, at Daytona. Saw Hunter Lawrence and Michael Moseman almost there against Craig on, on the other coast. But cra- they're crashing whenever they're trying to go that extra, the pace of Craig. Austin Faulkner's injured, Jeremy Martin's injured. They're getting guy in his 30s again, Kyle Chisholm at Star Yamaha because they have pretty much everyone bar Christian Craig injured. Christian Craig's 30 years old as well. 
Nickelodeon there, there. Yeah, should there be one Supercross class? And is there a lack of the, the decent talent coming up? But is there a lack of star? Not star yet. Well, there is a lack of star yet because they're all injured. <laughs> but is there is the depth of youth quality in America reduced compared to previous generations? Because I feel like maybe it is. Yeah, I don't disagree. And in terms of having one two fifty class, I, I would have always been in favour of that. But that's obviously the way they do it over there, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. But I mean, should guys like Nicoletti and Chisholm be able to ride in the two fifty class? For me, it's blocking an opportunity for a young rider. And I personally would rather the young rider get the opportunity, but at the same time, Nicoletti and Chisholm have worked hard their whole career. So, you know, you can't put it on them that the system allows them to race it, you know. So it's just one of those things, really. I think you're right, though, the talent coming up. There's, there's certainly not a, a Tomac or an RV that I know of coming up in America anyway. So be interesting. Of course, the one year Brand Sue is going to do the MS Supercross yeah. Championship, he gets injured. If he had been able to start, who knows, he could have got that star Yamaha ride. So very unfortunate for him. I think he could have opened, certainly opened, opened some eyes if he hadn't got injured. But that maybe sums up her brand Sue's career just when he's right on the verge of becoming big time, as it were, and, and one of the star men. And whether that's worth a championship or whether he's been concentrating on Supercross and then the COVID thing happened. And now just when he's in America, ready to go East Coast, this injury happens Something always seems to get in the way for for Brian Sue, but certainly I don't actually mind that the older, more experienced riders been in the class. I mean, I think Vince Freeze has certainly about him. provided entertainment in, in, in the West Coast. But should the younger riders not be better than the than the older riders? I mean, they're the, a lot of them are coming are still getting good rides and they're fast, but they're not sustaining their their lap times over the race. They're maybe making mistakes. Jet Lawrence has come over from Australia via EMX. He's the dominant guy with Dylan Ferrandis winning a couple of years ago with the 250 class. Yes, Adam Cincerillo's there. Chase Sexton, certainly the, an exception to that rule. He takes a lot of boxes. He's probably the next big guy. But Justin Cooper, again, he's also very fast. But I mean, Jeremy Martin's over 30. It's a wee bit hit and miss with a, with a, with a top tier talent coming through in America. Chase Sexton aside. Austin Faulkner was supposed to be that guy. Again, no fault of him. He's injured, but he's been injured a lot. He hasn't probably went to the potential of Jet Reynolds coming through again. He got injured. It's it's a tough kind of sport, it looks like, to make it in as a, a young kid coming through in America. It's either injuries or maybe not sustainable speed. They seem to have a lot of raw aggression in speed, but maybe they aren't, they aren't the smoothest to get that consistent. Yeah, well, the one thing to keep an eye on is They've signed GP talent in the past. It certainly wouldn't surprise me if they're looking to the GP paddock again in the future, as much as it pains me to say it. But they're going to have one eye on Kaido Wolf. And, and I know for a fact that Tebow Benny Stant certainly wouldn't say no to racing Supercross. So who knows what the future holds for them. I, I'd had rather them stay in GPs and see some American talent come over here. But yeah. we know it doesn't work like that. And yes. usually it's the GP guys go over there and race Supercross against the Americans as well as outdoors. So... Certainly something to keep an eye on if the younger talent doesn't improve in America because the, the GPs certainly aren't lacking in talent. And we know the one at Jago Gertz as well, actually, when they saw the speed of him practicing. And that speed certainly come to fruition with his uh, performances so far this year in MX2. And you mentioned the talent there, and part of the reason for that talent is the, I believe anyway, the EMX system, EMX yeah. 125. Kai Kazmacher is a, a case in point there with his speed student in MX2. But EMX 250 round one this weekend, Certainly plenty of, of strong riders there. Some very good racing. But it looks like it's coming down to what, to me, was a very smart Rick Elzinger. He's been beset by injuries a lot of times. A bit of a breakthrough year last year. But it looked very calm and composed in Mantova. Took the overall win. But the Fantics are coming. It could be him, 250 Yamaha versus the 250 two-stroke Fantics for this title. Tundell was very aggressive, wiped Bonacorsi out, and that was a wipeout. I mean, him and Malcolm Stewart should never race together because that could be painful. But that was a wipeout in half. He won the second moto. But for me, the kid that really impressed me was Osterhagen, straight off a 125 and a broken leg from last year, dominating the 125 class last year on this 250. And he used to be at least in the 90s, which shows you how old I am. You wouldn't necessarily have got someone at that kind of 16, 17-year-old jumping straight on the 250 
expect them to be fast. You would think of the bike would be too much for them with staying at one, two, five. Or telling maybe the exception, but even he had injuries, but he was a big, fairly big guy by the time he was 17, 18. I know Ron Machine won, I think he won a 250 Supercross at 16 in, in America in the 80s, but by and large, it's not the most common thing to do. And it's easy to forget that Oscar Haggard is riding a 252 stroke because he isn't in the main class in this AMX2 class, but he's so young, he's taken to it so fast. And you're just talking about their Norwegians there. This kid might be the most of them all. Yeah, well, the AMX 250 class, it's all about the two strokes, isn't it? The three of them in the top four and the overall. So there you go. Um, Live on. uh, Yeah, just coming into the season, for me, my pick for the championship was El Zinga and Pondell. And I think what I've seen at the weekend backs that up. I think they're going to be the two main men for the championship. But Osterhagen, what a start to the season, as you alluded to. Big, big talent. I mean, he missed a lot of racing last year after breaking his leg. Uh, so, you know, he, after missing a lot of racing, he's clearly hasn't affected him too much on the podium at his first attempt in the MX250 Championship. And I'm sure if he if he keeps improving, um, we'll probably see him win races this year. But just on El Zinga, I think that was a very mature ride. We all know he has speed. But, you know, he got bad starts and he just let the others make, make their mistakes. And then he came out on top. So impressive but I, I do think he might have his hands f- full with Tondell if he can keep it in two wheels because in the first one I think he had just passed Elzinga and got his way in the third so it looked like for all the world Tondell was going to win it and if he had won the first moto it would have been a 1-1 but it wasn't to be after the crash but um, it's certainly going to be some good racing in that championship and there's plenty of young talent in there too you know Talviku, McClellan, Mike Gorder, Prugner. Brazeras, Ralph Mewson, Betek, Olivia, plenty of talent in there for sure. You've just got a lesson in your pronunciation there by Northern Irishman, so oh, enjoy terrible. that. Um, Andrea Bonacorsi as well. I expect him yes, to yeah, be closer yeah. to the front in the coming rounds, but when you yeah. get taken out like that, it's going to yes. take the wind out of your sails. Mu- <laughs> not much he could have done about that there. And the second motor, he rode really well, actually. He was outside the top 20, and where did he get up to? Can't even remember now, but he came up well. Six, 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 that was was a good ride under the circumstances. I think he was outside the top twenty-five, so he's definitely got a lot of speed for sure. I think he'll he'll be he'll be a race winner actually. I think along with the three that were on the podium at the weekend, and then after that there'll be a few surprises, I'm sure as well. Yeah, just on the two strokes, it's a bit of a shame they can't ride a two stroke in the MX two class because it probably helps privateer costs as well. But it's it's just nice to see them battling at the front of a major championship and being so competitive as well. So I kind of like that about the MX250 class. It sort of has a bit of everything. Yeah, exactly. It's got a bit of everything. Um, some ex- uh, riders with a bit of experience you feel should be an MX2, but they're still there going for the title. And then you've got the bright young talents. Then you've got two strokes and four strokes. Literally has got everything. <laughs> right. Well, on that note, then we'll, we'll end this podcast because I think we've talked about everything. So on uh-huh. the, thanks very much. <laughs> And actually, no GP is going to be strange. You just get into the, the mix of the run of GPs again after two, but a week off. Then it's back to Argentina, which is, is nice. It makes life feel a bit more normal whenever there's more overseas Grand Prix again. Um, hopefully, there'll be a, a decent entry in, in, in front of motor racing uh, can, can help with that. Um, I'm scared about the Argentine entry. I think Beta and Gavin aren't going. So that's four good riders you'll not see in MXGP. So yeah, there'll be a lot of... I think that's where expenses need to be covered. You know, if yeah, absolutely. If riders are riding that fast and that competitively. There's a problem if they can yeah. to go there. So we'll we'll see what, tra- what transpires there. But certainly the first two Grand Prix have, have been a success. The American Supercross is certainly providing moments of action, at least a certain aggressive action from, <laughs> from different riders. And um, they are racing Williams. again. We all know, I'm sure. <laughs> but Justin Marsh is not even involved yet. Wait until he gets going. <laughs> no. Still Supercross next weekend. British Championship as well, I think, starts next weekend. Yeah, and Dutch Championship and French Championship. So, so still there, plenty of racing. There'll still be a lot going on. Uh, British Championship MX1 class could be good, but don't forget Isaac Gifting versus Conrad News mm-hmm. and MX2 could be pretty tasty, although Conrad News in the UK <laughs> is pretty phenomenal. So it'll be interesting to see if how close gifting can actually get to him and then see how that transpires in the next Grand Prix after that. Um, so definitely a lot of national championship racing to look forward to Supercross again next weekend. But for now, Andy, thank you. And Mantova MXGP and MS Supercross, that's a wrap. Ciao.